Amen. Uh, I'm wound up and ready to preach, and uh, I'm so thankful God gives me a message. Every time. I don't take it for granted. Uh, I try not to. I try to be ready to preach, and I try to do uh, what the Lord would ask me to do, and I'm just thankful. This is what I want to preach to you this morning. If you take notes, if you're titling your message, I want to preach this sermon. A good dose of the can't help it. Amen? Amen. That's, that's what I want to preach this morning. A good dose of the can't help it. I see you're standing already, so I don't need to ask you. Amen? Uh, the Bible says in chapter 3 of the book of Daniel, here's what it says. Nebuchadnezzar, the king, made an image of gold whose weight... Uh, whose height was three score cubits, and the breadth thereof six cubits. He set it up in the plain of Dura, in the province of Babylon. Then Nebuchadnezzar the king sent together, to get, uh, together the princes, the governors, and the captains, the judges, the treasurers, the counselors, the sheriffs, and all the rulers of the province to come to the dedication of the image which Nebuchadnezzar the king had set up. And verse 3 says he finally gathered them together. Skip to verse 4. It says, Then a herald came aloud, uh, cried aloud, To you it is commanded, O people, nations, and languages, that at what time you hear the sound of the cornet, the flute, the harp, the sacrament, the psaltery, the dulcimer, and all kinds of music, ye fall down and worship the golden image that Nebuchadnezzar the king had set up. And whosoever falleth not down and worship shall the same hour be cast into the midst of a burning, fiery furnace. The Bible says that in the beginning of verse 7 that he, he sounds out and everybody bows. And here's what it says at the very end. Everybody, the nations and the languages fell down and worshipped the golden image that Nebuchadnezzar the king had set up. Verse 8, wherefore at that time certain Chaldeans, that's just astronomers, uh, uh, folks that are in charge, amen, uh, came near and accused the Jews. Well, we have those, don't we? They spake and said to the king Nebuchadnezzar, O king, live forever. Thou, O king, hast made a decree that every man that shall hear the sound of all these mus uh, uh, instruments and all these things shall fall down and worship the image. Verse 11 says, And whosoever falleth not down and worship, that he should be cast into the midst of a burning, fiery furnace. There are certain Jews who thou hast set over the affairs of the province of Babylon, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. These men, O king, have not regarded thee. They serve not thy gods, nor worship the golden image which thou hast set up. Then Nebuchadnezzar in his rage and fury commanded, Bring Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Then they brought the men before the king. Nebuchadnezzar spake and said unto them, Is it true, O Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego? Do not you serve my gods, nor uh, do, you, do not ye serve my gods nor worship the golden image which I have set up? Now, if ye be ready, that at what time ye hear the sound of the cornet and the flute and the harp and the sacrament and the psaltery and the dulcimer and all kinds of music, ye fall down and worship the image which I have made well. But if ye worship not, ye shall be cast the, in, you shall be cast the same hour into the midst of the fire of the fiery furnace. And who is that God that shall deliver you out of my hand? Let us pray. Lord God, we love you and we thank you this morning. We thank you for your word. We thank you for the music and all the uh, time and energy that goes into that. We thank you for Brother Jimmy. Uh, we thank you for the pastors and preachers filling in. And uh, Lord, just ask you to bless this church, Lord, and uh, help them. In Jesus' name we pray, we ask you to move on us now. Do what only the Word can do. In Jesus' name, amen. You can be seated. 
There's something interesting in this passage. Now, we can talk about all the weight of things and all that kinds of stuff, but I'm a little bit of a simple guy. Amen? I, I like application preaching. Here's what I mean by that. If you, I, I want to make sure that when we leave here, that you can take the Word of God that was preached to you this morning, and it will be straight from the Word of God. It won't be coy. And then afterwards, what you can do with it is you can immediately apply it to your life. Because we need that this morning. Uh, really, in the title, when I say to you, we need a good dose of the can't help it, so we need a good dose of Jesus, what I mean by that is, it's about time that the church uh, recognize who they are, what they are, and stand outside of the walls of the church and tell some people about Jesus and who they are and what they came from and where we're going. Because everybody else is. Amen? Everybody else is telling and saying what they think. And it seems like, it just seems like, maybe I'm wrong, maybe I'm dumb, maybe I'm ignorant. But it just seems like the church is just count down a little bit. And in here we can say, oh, worthy is the Lamb. But outside the walls, you say, oh, you can amen or oh my, I know I'm right. <laughs> amen. So this morning, this morning, I just want to preach a little bit. I want to give you three simple points this morning and, and, and three things that the Lord, I believe, has given me that, that we can hold on to and understand. Listen, when you got saved, you've got a few things. Amen? Yeah. We need to grab a hold of those. The Bible says that there was this king, Nebuchadnezzar. You can tie Nebuchadnezzar to Babylon. He was the king of Babylon. Babylon came around uh, uh, in Genesis chapter 6 when the people of God did not want to do what they were supposed to do and had to scatter abroad across the face of the earth and multiply and tell people uh, and each other about Jesus. Amen? And so what they did, they tried to build a big old tower at the Tower of Babel. God confounded their speech. They spread out everywhere. But... A remnant remained, and from that place and that plain that was so beautiful came the great city Babylon, which is the same thing as referring to hell, basically. Amen? And so here we are, looking at that. This king of Babylon, he thinks he's something. I mean, he thinks he's something, and he's got every person cowing down before him. He builds an image, it's basically an image of himself. He pushes it out in the plain. He takes a few months and says, call all my people in. You see, he was over basically the known world. And so he says, I want all the, the administration to come and all the people they can to come. And I want them to sit out there in the congregation, if they will. And then I'm going to play. I've got my people already practicing some music. Hell never can answer. Oh, what a wonderful guy. Look at that golden image. And he says, at the end of that music, when it stops, I, I've orchestrated all this. We may even take up an offering uh, for old Satan. He says, I want you to bow down. I want you to cow down, if you will, and worship that image. And if you don't, I've lit my furnace, and I'll just throw you in it. That's what he's saying. Amen? That's what he's saying. The Bible says that at the end of all that, that there's three old boys. Daniel was on a road trip somewhere, apparently. Thank you. There's three old boys that uh, didn't bow. And Lord, don't you know people are quick when you don't bow. I mean, when you go to school and you wear a shirt that says something like, Satan sucks, but Jesus saves. Amen? Uh, they get mad. I mean, they want to tell on you. When you go to school and you open your Bible and you start to read it, they want to tell on you. They don't mind you reading something else, but they don't want you to do that. Or when you go to work and you start talking to people about the Lord, hey, you can talk to them about anything. Don't you talk to them about the Lord? Oh, and then what happens? Well, if we don't watch it, the Christians will start to cow down. Just like everybody else. But there's three old boys in this passage that didn't do it. There's three things I want to talk to you about. I want to talk to you about confidence this morning. Confidence, conviction, and claim. Now when you hear me give that point, I want you to do this. In Jesus. If I'm talking to you about confidence, that's what I want to hear. Amen. So number one, I want to talk to you about having confidence. Amen. As we look at that, I want you to look at verse 16 of our text. Daniel chapter 
3, verse 16. After all of this happens, he says, Who will deliver? What God do you know? That's what Nebuchadnezzar said. Who do you think you are? What God do you think you have that can deliver you out of my hand? Because I am the man. That's what Nebuchadnezzar said. Listen to this. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered and said to thee, no, to the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we are not careful to answer thee in this matter. If it be so, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the burning fiery furnace. And he will deliver us out of thine hand, O king. I'll tell you what, I'm, tell, I'm telling you that's some confidence. You need to know Nebuchadnezzar was a, a mighty man, the greatest king alive then. I mean, he had everything in the known world given to him. He's got it in his hand. Everyone else had bowed. Three men are standing in his presence. They pull them aside, bring them right up to the king, and now they're standing, and they have a voice before the king. And he says, oh boy, here's your shot. I want to know something. You going to bow down or not? He said, well, we're not really slow in answering you. We only got one answer. Amen? You know the word as I looked at confident. Here's what it means. Courage, belief, or to be secure. To, to have courage, belief, or to be secure. The, these men had something that I, I believe is lacking in the local church this morning. And that is an overwhelming confidence that they are secure. That they believe in the Lord Jesus Christ that Satan is the same one that will keep them out of the furnace. Oh, I, I really didn't say that right. It won't keep them out of the furnace. It will be with him in the furnace. Confidence. It's an incredible thing. I want you to look at something. They did not have confidence. I'm just checking on you. You don't have to do it anymore. They did not have confidence in their physical works. They did not have confidence in their physical works. Listen to what it says in Ephesians chapter 2. Ephesians chapter 2. Mm. Going the wrong way. There we go. Ephesians chapter 2. I could really read you the whole thing. But we know what verse 7 and 8 says. But, but he, he gives you some stuff in Ephesians chapter 2. Now, I've just got to take a while. I'm just telling you. I'm like, i got a lot to say and a little time to say it. And this is what Ephesians chapter 2 says, though. You know, I read this to an old man. I read this to an old boy at work this week. I talked to him a little bit. He had asked an old boy there at church about his, uh, about his salvation. And he told him. Then he came and asked me when I got saved. And I told him, I said, well, you've talked to us about ours. Can I talk to you about yours? Come on. Oh. And so he told me a time, and he, as he was talking, he said, well, I guess that's really not salvation. I said, well, let me talk to you about that. We started talking, and I told him exactly what was going on, and, and we knelt down over an old toolbox. And the old boy said, Lord, will you forgive me of my sins? Oh, I'm telling you. Hey, you know what we don't need? We don't need a bunch of weak, backbone Christians that won't say nothing to somebody in the uh, outside of the house of God. We need some that will stand up with a little confidence. Amen. Hey, we need some confidence in what we say. Now, I, need, I know that there's been some folk, you've seen them have confidence in what they say, and they don't know what they're talking about. I'll get to that in a minute. But I want to show you what confidence does or what it doesn't do. First of all, it doesn't rely on your works. The Bible says in chapter 2 of Ephesians, you, you that are saved, you have the quickened who are dead alive. It means to be made alive. You have the quickened who are dead in trespasses and sin. Where in time past, you walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the spirit of the air, the, that now worketh in the children of disobedience. We can understand that. Here's what he says. Coy, you that have been made alive in Christ, you that got saved, I remember when you walked just like the world walked. Right. Amen? I can get that. He goes on to say this. Among whom also we had our conversation in time past. In the lust of the flesh, of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and the mind, and were by nature the children of wrath, even as others. But God 
who is rich in mercy for his great love wherewith he loved us, even when we were dead in sin, hath quickened us together with Christ. By grace are you saved. He says, but God did that for you. And he says, and have raised us up together and made us to sit in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. I'm telling you this morning, this is the closest to heaven you'll ever get when you get to sit together and say, worthy, worthy, worthy is the Lamb. Oh, seated on the throne. We crown you now with many crowns because you reign victorious. Hey, man, I'm telling you, that song is a picture of the time when you'll take your crowns and lay them at Jesus' feet and we'll sit out there Say, worthy is the Lamb. See it. See it. He says, and hath raised us up like the verse 7 says, that in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace and his kindness toward us through Christ Jesus. For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is a gift of God, not of God works. Let's see any of us old boys start boasting like Nebuchadnezzar. That's exactly what he's saying. He says, then he says this, listen to this. We can't boast of our works, but then he said in verse 10, for we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. Wherefore, remember, i got to read this. you, you got to hear this. Remember, we're talking about having confidence in the Lord. A confidence as a Christian. He says, Wherefore, remember that ye being in time past Gentiles in the flesh, who are called uncircumcision, by which is called the circumcision. He said, Jews calls you uncircumcised. That's what he says. In the flesh, made by hands. That at that time you were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel, and were strangers from the covenants of the promises having no hope, and without God in the world. You remember that? I want one of you old boys, I want one of you nice ladies, think about when you were without God, and you had no hope and no promises without Him, and you think where you're at now. I'll tell you, hey, Bill, those bills don't feel so bad this morning, do they? You probably put them aside. You probably put your Facebook aside, and not worry about what anybody's saying this morning, if you have to like it or dislike it. Amen. Amen. He says, hey, you were without him. Listen, verse 13 says, but now, Christ Jesus, uh, ye who sometimes were afar off, but now in Christ Jesus, ye who sometimes are far off, are made nigh by the blood of Christ. Amen. Folks, it's not in your works. It's not in your works. There's a confidence that you have. There's a courage that you have. There's a security that you have. But it's not in your works. I'm telling you, young lady, if you're out there and you're, you're fixing to try and find you a man, amen, and you look around and you try and place all your confidence in him, he will let you down. Amen. Young man, if you're trying to find who you are within a woman's flesh, she will let you down. But if you'll cast all your hopes and cares on Jesus. Some of you put it in a bottle. Amen. Some of it, your confidence is in pills. Some of it's in your work or your wealth. Some of it's in all those things. Hey, he says it's not in your works. Number two, your confidence, it's not in your wealth. In chapter 19 of Matthew, chapter 20, Matthew 19, verse 22, there's a story that ends there. It's the story of a rich ruler. He says, hey, Jesus, tell me what i got to do to be saved. He says, keep the commandments. He said, oh, I've done all that. Well, he already lied to the Lord, didn't he? He said, oh, God, I'm sorry. Let me, let me get a little closer with you on that. He said, sell everything you got, give it to the poor, and come follow me. And the scripture says in verse 22, and he walked away Sorrowfully. Why? Finishes up and says, because he had much. There's a whole lot of us got a lot more than what we started when we came here. Amen. You go ahead and put your trust in it. Go ahead and put your trust in it. And I'll tell you what you do. You, here's what you'll do with it. 
you'll start you'll start trying to decide if your witness is worth your worth. Now listen to what I said. Is your witness worth your worth? You know, if I say something old so and so, will he do this and then that contract may disappear or that happened, then I did. That ain't the way it works. Sell all that you have. Well, we like those verses that says, hey, if your eye thing you, pluck it out. Right? Better to enter heaven with one eye than hell whole. But when it hits the road on something like this, here's what he's saying. Some of us measure our worth now and think that we have to be careful of our witness because we're worth something. Oh, yeah. That's a word right there. You just let that sink in. I'm telling you, you were poor, lost, wretched. We just read it in Ephesians. You weren't anything. You were a speck of nothing, headed to a nowhere hell. And God said, I'm the one that made you worth something. I'm the one that died for you. I'm the one that loves you. Why don't you come follow me? You said, hey, you, you ran back like that old boy who had sold out, took all his daddy head and squandered it. And said, oh God, if I could just be a servant. And he said, welcome home, son. Welcome home. Well, let me get on this pulpit area for just a minute. One of the major problems we have in Baptist churches in general, but certainly throughout the nation and everything, is we have some men of God that will stand in the pulpit and figure out how to speak eloquently like, oh, Apollos, the problem is we need some Aquila and Priscilla's to straighten them up and say, boy, there's a more, uh, a more better way. And, and they, they want to wax eloquent for the worth of what they feel like their knowledge in school is. Can I tell you, I, I went to college, I got a Bible degree, but I'm telling you what, it's the hard knocks of life of walking through that marriage with me and her, of seeing church after church, seeing them raise up, seeing them go down, seeing them kick us out, and seeing us run off. Amen. It's the hard knocks that teach you something. Amen. Amen. And through all that, you know what I'm getting this morning? I got a little confidence. Amen. I ain't got it in me. I learned that lesson. But I got it in what I'm preaching. And I know whom I have believed in and am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I've committed unto him against that day. <laughs> Woo! That's why I can go. Woo! Y'all look at me like I'm crazy. I don't have to come back. I just got to keep going. Amen. Listen, it can't be. Confidence can't be in your work. It can't be in your work. And it can't be in your physical witness. It has to come from a spiritual birth. It can't be in your physical witness. I want to show you something in Philippians. Turn to Philippians with me. Just past Ephesians. Philippians chapter 1. Verse 6. Philippians chapter 1 and verse 6 says this. Being confident, Paul writes to the Philippian church, of this very thing, that he which hath begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. Amen. That he which hath begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of of Jesus Christ. Now I want you to take our text and get, get in the mind frame of our text. We think that about that passage when we teach it a lot of times as pastors and, and, and Sunday school teachers, we teach that passage, we'll say, God that began something in you is going to work with you and, and, and help you and mold you and shape you. And that's exactly right, right? Until the day that Jesus returns or you go to meet him. But put it in the context of our passage. They'll be dead within 20 minutes. Is he that begun a good work in you? Are you still letting him work in you? Are you letting him perform that which you said you committed unto him? Because we think we got all the time in the world and made plans for lunch. 
we're going to try and catch a little bit of game if we can before we head to church. And hopefully if church ends quick, we can get back to see the end of that woman. But thy soul may be required of thee this night. He which hath he done a good work in you. Is it performed to its end this morning? Well done, thy good and faithful servant. You entered in a little quicker than you thought. You put it in that context, it just, it's right there, isn't it? I mean, dare I say, there are some folks that are contemplating a few hours, a few days, a few months of life left. Oh, if we looked at things, I don't, I don't do this much when I preach. Hi, I want to tell you a little story. <laughs> it's ain't story time. I've got an urgency about a message from our Lord and Savior. Why? Because he may require my life in just a little bit. I want to fix it. And by the way, I, I'm over trying to figure out if you think I finished well. <laughs> I'm looking at Jesus, the author and finisher of my faith. Confidence, brother, to speak that which you have, you know, and we're going to get to that. I hope you have some confidence in your message. If you don't, here's the problem. Number two, conviction. Conviction. Amen. If you have confidence. But do you have conviction? You see, conviction, you can quit now, I just mess with <laughs> Conviction, it, it means this, persuaded, or an inward certainty, to be content, to trust, or to yield. Not interesting. Conviction. You see, what it does in your life is it brings about something. You, you can have confidence and say, you ever heard someone talking about something? And they had confidence in it and had no idea what they were talking about. My little granddaughter, one of them, goes to a little church, private church school. And uh, the other day, the Gideons came in. And they presented them with Bible if they had one or didn't have one. You know, they gave Bibles out and she's told all about it. She comes home to her mom and she says, the Gideons came. And her mom said, what? She said, the Gideons and her mama said, the Gideons? She said, no. Now, you think you got to draw. Uh-uh. This little girl's got to draw. She said, no. The Gideons came to church, to the school, and gave us all a Bible. And the Gideons go all over giving Bibles. Boy, she was so excited about it. She got a little Bible, you know, her little Gideon Bible. So when me and Lola saw her, saw her we were like, did the Gideons come? Mm-hmm. Where are they? The Indians. She was so confident. I'm afraid there's a whole bunch of Christians that got religion sitting in the church. But you don't have any conviction. You see, you got... I, I wonder how many of those folks that were out there that day, Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, and Daniel talked to about the Lord and they got saved. Oh, yeah, man, we're with you. Now, you got to remember, all four of them old boys was leaders. They were leaders within Babylon because they were such outstanding men. And basically, the king let them alone. Uh, and they worshiped and ate how they needed to to believe in their God, right? But when it came down to it, I only see three people standing. Now, Daniel was not mentioned in the text. He's not around here. It's three people, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, standing. Where are them folks they had talked to? Where are those conversions? Huh. You ever see that before? The mass exodus of the tares? 
Amen. Amen. Turn to Romans chapter 8. Confidence, real confidence comes from your conviction. That is your contentness, your trust, your yielding to the Lord, your inward certainty. You ever preach, you hear a preacher amen himself? That's when the preacher people are, oh my, and they, they ain't sure if they want to take what he's saying, but he's read it, he's studied it, he knows it. And, and he just says, amen. I've gotten in the car before, I tell this a lot, but I get in the car with Kenya, I say, well, it's just me and you and Jesus today. Amen. <laughs> what I mean is, I don't know if they took it home with them. If I'm traveling on my own, I'll say it out loud. Just me and you today, Jesus. Hmm. Let me call Kenya. Hey, it'll be like that sometimes. Amen. Amen. God will give you a word sometimes. He ain't given somebody else. Right. Now, I'm not telling you to go and preach to something that's not in the word of God. But he'll give you something out of here, and it's just yours to learn from, to do. But I'm telling you, when it comes to your salvation, you better have a word about you. Amen. Your conviction gives you that confidence. Look at what Romans chapter 8. Y'all are there before me. Read it. No. Romans chapter 8 says this. And let's move up a little bit. Verse 36. As it is written, uh, for thy sake are they killed all the day long. We are counted as sheep for the slaughter. Verse 37, really. Nay, in all things we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. Now, something? What an amazing way to start. For I am what? Persuaded. What am I? Persuaded. Oh, wait. I'm convinced. I, I know it's true. I've got something that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities. Uh, why did he put angels in there? You remember that passage in Corinthians? He said, hey, if an angel or anybody else preached something contrary to the word, count them accursed. Right. He said, I want to tell you, don't let, listen, don't let somebody or something, right, or some thought take your salvation. If they did, you ain't got it. Right. The Bible said, you know what I told that old boy the other day? I said, listen. God can't even take that from you if you meant what you said. Because God cannot lie. And he said, if then, that's an if then promise. If my people which are called, then I'll do this. Well, if you'll confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus Christ and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the mouth confession is made, but with the heart man believeth unto salvation. Man, did you get saved? Or did you just get a little less lost than you thought you were? If you don't have any conviction about it, your confidence will wane at the end and you'll bow before an unholy God and send yourself to hell. Don't blame Jesus or the preacher. He says, for I'm persuaded of all these things. Principalities, uh, height, nor depth, nor uh, any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus. There it is again, our Lord. Now something, hey man, you got to have some confidence in your in your uh, uh, convictions. Do you have any? You, you know, I'm sick and tired of the church arguing about certain things. Is it right to drink? I got confidence in mine. Let me give me some of this water. Because you won't find this old boy drinking. Y'all know what I mean by drinking. Alcohol. Uh-uh. I'll never forget about 10, 15 years ago, I went into a store. I don't pay attention to stuff. I saw Mike's Hard Lemonade. I'm looking around like, that'd be good. Kenya said, what are you doing? I'm looking at the bottle. She said, I said, I don't know, I just moved for lemonade. She said, that ain't lemonade. I'm like, what? I so I didn't get that it. I didn't. I saw it come up. My car in a minute. I didn't know that it was alcohol. I was about to buy me some Mike's Heart. I thought it was like really powerful lemonade. <laughs> it is. Just not the way I thought. Amen. Almost messed up my conviction, though. <laughs> I ain't kidding. You, I did it. I, I didn't make that one up. <laughs> I don't know when you back. Well, I promise when I end up anyway. Uh, listen, you need to have 
conviction. The conviction in your life will help you understand the confidence you have when you speak. But all those things come from Christ. That is why if a preacher steps up in this pulpit and he begins to speak, well, I think we're in trouble. I didn't ask you to think. That's what God's saying to him. I ask you to get in that Word of God right there and preach what the Word of God says. Amen. Amen. Preach what the Word of God says. That's where your conviction comes from. You, The worst thing in the world is really, oh, let's see, uh, well, he turned water into wine. That's enough studying for me. Let's go have one. You don't have any conviction. You're not even convinced it's right. You just want a drink. Why don't you repent, it, repent and get it right? Yeah, I can see. Uh -huh. I'm just telling you, there's all kinds of stuff like that. We want to argue, fuss, and fight and say, well, we're trying to work things out. Hey, man, just, just get things right with God. Tell some people about Jesus. I mean, our world, listen, you get folks saved because they see the realness in you. They see the conviction you have, the confidence you have. Hey, somebody, that's what will change things. Amen? Not only is there confidence, conviction. The last one. I want you to see the claim that was made. I want to show you where conviction was real quick. In verse 18. This is incredible conviction. I, I, I want to move on too quick. I, I, I've got to show you this. So confidence comes in verse 16 and 17 of our text, Daniel chapter 3. But verse 18 gives you the conviction. Listen to this. But if not, and he says, listen, king, we're not slow to answer you. We're not going to bow down before those things. We know who we are. We're confident in that. Why? Well, because they have conviction. Listen to this verse 18. But if not, if not, be it known unto thee, O king, that we will not serve thy gods, nor worship the golden image which thou hast set up. <laughs> That's incredible conviction. And what he said is, we know only one God to serve. That's what he's telling. Him. He's saying, you're not a God. That, that big image is not a God. This is the only God we serve, is, is our God. Though we are in slavery, we don't understand why. Though you think you're mightier than our God, you have no idea what's about to happen. Neither do we, but we trust Him. We trust Him. Man, they had conviction of things. So with those principles, the third thing happens. The claim. In Jesus! Almost got it. The claim. You're going to see what I mean by that in a minute. Let's read a little bit of the story. Verse 19 says, Then was Nebuchadnezzar uh, full of fury. Does that sound like anybody you know today? Does that sound like our government? They're just full of fury, aren't they? Matter in a horn. And the form of his vis visage, it means his face was red, was changed against Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Therefore he spake and commanded that they should... Heat the furnace one seven times more than it was wont to be heated. And he commanded the most mighty men that, they were, uh, that were in his army to bind Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and to cast them into the burning fiery furnace. Then these men which were bound in their coats with their hosen and with their hats and uh, their other garments and were cast into the midst of the burning fiery furnace. Therefore, because the king commanded, uh, commandment was urgent and the furnace exceeding hot, the flame also of the fire slew those men that took up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. It literally burnt those guys. It's so hot. And these three men, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, fell down bound in the midst of the burning fiery furnace. Then Nebuchadnezzar the king was astonished and rose up in haste and spake and said unto the, his counselors, Did not we cast three men bound into the midst of the fire? They answered and said unto the king, True, true, O king. He answered and said, Lo, I see four men loose walking in the midst of the fire, and they have not hurt, and the, fourth of the, and the form of the fourth is like unto the Son of God. Then Nebuchadnezzar came near to the mouth of the burning fiery furnace and spake and said, O Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, 
Your servant, ye servants of the Most High God, come forth and come hither. Then Shadrach and Meshach and Abednego came forth of the midst of the fiery furnace. And then Chaldeans who ran their mouth went, Oh my goodness, what have we got ourselves into? Confidence comes from your conviction. Conviction comes when you begin to take, when you begin to take and apply, apply the word of God to your life. But before that comes a claim. There's a claim. Here's what that claim says. Here's the definition of that word. Let me give it to you. To ask, to ask for, especially as a right, or to take as the rightful owner. <laughs> to assert in the fierce, um, or in the face of possible contradiction. That Jesus is my Savior. It's a claim here that they took. If you were to go to Ruth chapter 4. Oh, Ruth's a wonderful book, right? And you read how the kinsman redeemer, right? The kinsman redeemer buys Ruth back. What happened is, you know the story, Naomi Pleasantness and Mel, uh, Elimelech, my God is king, decide to leave the house of bread, the house of praise, Bethlehem, Judah. And they decide to take their motor home and travel down to Moab, the garbage dump of society. But it says they chilled out there and found some stuff they kind of like to do. They had a few sons, male and children, sickly and unhealthy. It's kind of what their names mean. Those two sons married two Moabites. The three men die. Naomi, pleasantness is now reeking of sin. And she knows she made a mistake. She tells her two daughters-in-law, go back to your people. One of them walks off the pages of the Bible. But Ruth says, we use it in Bibles, Entreat me not to leave thee, for whether thou goest, I go, whether thou lodge, thou lodge, my, thy people be my people, thy God my God. Naomi can't get rid of her. She says, well, come on. I'm already embarrassed enough. Can't hurt much worse. She goes there, and one of Naomi's, I believe, cousins, something like that, named Boaz, has some fields. And Ruth will begin to glean in those fields. What people would do, instead of us, you know, just writing $300 checks every week to people who, uh, some that can't, but some that won't work. Amen, Amen or oh mommy. Amen. What they do is men, men that were loved the Lord, they would, they would leave. There's always something left in the field even after you picked everything. There's some gleaning. And then Boaz noticed she was hustling a lot to get some. So he says, stack a little up at the end of the road to leave it for her. And he noticed that she was a good woman. Naomi noticed that he noticed. She kind of made sure they connected a little bit. And the day came when Boaz had to buy her back. Now here's the kinsman redeemer law. And they meet in the front of the city in the gate. Oh, I could talk to you for hours about that stuff. But they meet in the gate and Boaz says to the nearest kinsman redeemer, he's the second in line, but he says to the nearest kinsman redeemer, that is the one closest to Naomi and, and Elimelech, her husband that died. He says to him, listen, there's some land that they have, blah, 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 house, that kind of stuff, and Naomi's here, will you redeem it? He says, I'll redeem it. He says, well, when you do, you've got to marry Ruth. He's left off a granddaughter-in-law. He says, oh, I can't do that. I'm not splitting my fortune. I like my kid. That's why I'm splitting my fortune with somebody else. You redeem it. You have it. He said, I'll redeem it. And old Boaz takes his shoe off. That's what they did, handed it to him. He said, I'll redeem it. And then he went and paid the price. And the Bible says that he married Ruth. Ruth is one of the four women mentioned in the genealogy of Christ when you move to the New Testament. And he bought her. He bought her at a price. Amen. And from then on, you know what he could say? 
And then old Elimelech, you saw no, sir. He did. I bought it, though. I got the deed. There's his granddaughter-in-law. We've raised some good-looking youngs. Naomi's taken care of. And she's helping us watch him when I go out to work. I claim that one. I want you to know something. If you're in here this morning and you're lost or you're saved, have you claimed your salvation? Have you grabbed a hold of it lately and said, man, I'm a, I'm a child of the king. I mean, I've got a right to grab a hold of that. Because Ephesians chapter 2 said, I who was once far off and wasn't even in the commonwealth of Israel. I was a nobody. But God saved us all nobody. And he said, I'll graft you in, son. As, the, as, the, uh, as Israel, it's an olive branch. I'll graft you right into that thing. And you'll just take off just like that. You'll prosper in me. Why? Because I did my part. Amen. All you got to do is claim it. Now, you listen to me. I'm not a name and a claim and preacher. What I'm telling you is that we have folks walking around Oh, oh, fear has gripped my life. COVID. And I, I want you to know something. I, I got friends and I've got a cousin who's on her deathbed right now. I understand how bad COVID is. I understand more importantly that man made it. Evil man made it to hurt men. But you listen to me. I'm not going to walk down around with my head down. I'm not going to walk around defeated. You say, I'm so sick of hearing about COVID, but I'm even more. And these preachers get up and they hammer on. Listen to me. That's our job. Fear not. I'm with thee, ye saints of the Lord. Amen. Man, man, we start, we start preaching on this now and they start wanting to just kind of hide out in their chair. Man, I didn't tell you not to wear a mask. I don't care if you get a full breathing apparatus somewhere, but I, you better in between tell somebody about Jesus. He didn't ask you to shut up. He said, take care of yourself if you want to. How you do that is your business, by the way. It's not this old preacher's business. I'm not going to make fun of anybody wearing a mask. I'm not going to make fun of anybody that's got uh, a disease. Hey, hey you got to take care of yourself. But I'm telling you what, he never told you to fear everything else more than you fear me. The church don't shut down. God's people don't quit. You want to know how we got such a strong hole in some of these places? Because two years ago we was all hooting and hollering and screaming and yelling. And then the government said, you better fear me. You better fear me. You better bow before the image that I've built in front of you. And a whole bunch of folks who didn't know Jesus, they kept down. And I'm telling you what, what you don't read is the rest of the scripture. If you were to keep reading, you'll find out that the people that cowed down before old Nebuchadnezzar who said, who is your God that will walk in front of me, big boy? It won't be just a few years old Nebuchadnezzar will be cowing down himself. For seven years he eats kind. And the dude grows on his back, lays on his back at night, and the sun on his day. Amen? And he walks around like a madman eating grass until he comes to his senses and says, that God is king. Amen. My question to you, Ed, is where is your confidence? My question to you is where is your conviction? My question to you this morning is where is your claim? Hebrews, I've got to go there. I don't know if we've got time. Just leave if you need to. I'll keep preaching. Amen. Amen. Hebrews says this. I'm telling you, I've got to get it out, man. Woo, i got to get it out. Listen to what Hebrews chapter 12 says. Oh, man, let brotherly love continue. Be not forgetful um, uh, to entertain strangers, for thereby some have entertained angels unawares. I wonder how many we've entertained during COVID, and he's heard how depressed we are. It said, Lord, I can't do nothing with them. What you want me to do? Because they're all wound up in that junk. He said, remember them that are in bonds as bound with them and them which suffer adversity as being yourselves also in the body. I'm telling you, that's how you remember your pastor has cancer and that he's fighting is that you say, oh God, I've got heaviness of heart for my pastor. Oh, you lift that bondage and let him stand in the pulpit and preach God and the certainty of 
of salvation in Jesus Christ. Amen. Let your conversation be without covetousness and be uh, content with such things that you have. For he has said, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. So that we may boldly say, the Lord is my helper and I will not fear what man shall do unto me. Woo! I will not fear. Hey, I'm telling you, I forget that I'm lying. I try not to let people even tell me. You told me I knew it. Amen. Hey, I try to forget I'm, because I know people don't like this kind of preaching anymore. I know they're thinking, he doesn't have a good college education. No, ma'am, I've got a great college education. My problem was, I got a little bit of the title of this mention. I got the King Helpers, and I ain't worried about what you think about me. I'm not worried about the DR in front of my name or the W behind me. I'm telling you, I'm all the rest of my life. I want to spend it telling somebody about Jesus. Most churches may not let me in. That's why I started some prayer groups. Hey, I just started teaching Bible wherever I can. I'm not worried about that. I'm worried about getting the real message out. I'm not worried about saying to you at the end of this thing. Now, if you feel like God has moved on you in some small way, why don't you leave a token to Him? Uh-uh. What I'm saying, if you feel like God has moved on you, he, he got to move on you in a great way. And don't leave a token. Just write something down there. Lord, I give you everything. And put that in an offering plate. You'll give what's right. You'll do what's right. You'll fight what's wrong. And you'll move forward in your walk. But you'll have confidence in this thing that he which begun it will finish it. Amen. I'm glad I sat under some old wild preaching. Amen. I'm glad I sat under some old boys that said, hey, I'm just going to preach just saith the Lord. I tell you, I've, said, I've seen the best preach and I've seen the worst preach, whatever that means. I don't know what that really means. That old boy in preach. Listen, I saw some guys preach messages. They never leave this area and they do a good job and their conviction falls. I'm not that guy. I'm weird. Hey, Amen. I understand. It. That's not what I'm talking about when I say preaching. I'm just telling you, a man ought to stand up in the pulpit, having tried all week to live for the Lord, having tried to get a message, and having tried to get it out. I got to get to this. Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today, and forever and first day. Be not carried about with ever diverse and strange doctrines, for it is a good thing. It is a good thing that the heart be established with grace, not with meats, which have not profited them that have been uh, occupied therein. We have an altar. <laughs> we have an altar where they have no right to eat which serve the tabernacle. For the bodies of those beasts whose blood is bought are brought into the sanctuary by the high priest for sin are buried without the camp. Wherefore, Jesus also, also uh, <clears throat> that he might sanctify the people with his own blood suffered without the gate. Let us therefore unto him without the camp bearing his reproach. For, <clears throat> hold on, I want to read one, one passage here. Oh, here it is. Jump back to Hebrews 12, 12. Hebrews 12, 12. Got to get this in. Wherefore, Lift up your hands, which hang down, and the feeble knees, and make straight paths for your feet, lest that which is lame be turned out of the way, but let it rather be healed. Wherefore, let us make, uh, take our hands that hang down and our feeble knees, and make straight paths for your feet. Listen. He ends this message. He ends this passage. That's why I jumped on to the next one by saying this. For our God is a consuming fire. How are you going to stand? I'm not asking you today to pray that God won't put you in the fire. I'm telling you that if you'll serve Jesus, you're going to be in the fire. But I've heard this, this phrase all my life. Well, you fight fire with fire. Well, God is a consuming fire. Amen? Amen? I want you to let that sink in. 
those old boys went down in that furnace red hot. They were red hot for the Lord. Oh, Nebuchadnezzar, we're not slow to answer you. We're already in love with the one who can make us, break us, or take us. Right. So we're not really worried about you. If he lets you have this day of victory, so be it. He'll take us on. But we won't bow down to a God. Amen. If they could have did a little prophesying right there and said, but you will in just a few years. <laughs> you want to fight fire with fire this morning? Well, then get red hot for Amen. the Lord. Amen. Get red hot for the Lord. I'm going to close. I want to make sure that if you're in here this morning, you say, I, you know what? I got a little confidence and got a little conviction. I'm glad. I hope you do. You want all of that, though. You want to be able to claim something. You need to know it's yours. Jesus said, <clears throat> Jesus said that uh, you know him. I want you to search your heart. I want you to think about your salvation day. Did you get saved? Or were you playing around? Did you just do some leg work? Because you've been in church long enough to know what to do? You said, Brother Coy, what are you saying? Listen, my wife's got a wonderful testimony of that. Saved about six years ago or so. I didn't ever know she was lost. She's a pastor's wife for 14 or so years then. What a blessing. I didn't ever know she was lost. She never did something that until she got saved. And oh my goodness. I was like, man, that's something. I went back and said, Lord, no, you're going to do it. Okay, yeah, I'm good. All right. I want to make sure myself, amen. You know how you make sure? Scripture. Right. If you're in here this morning and you can't by Scripture know that you're saved and the Spirit that's in you or lack of it, hey man, this is your time to get saved. Because that claim, it gives you something. The right to call upon, the right to read the Word and then begin to come and help you for you to get some conviction about you so that you'll have confidence when you stand before someone especially the one who saved you being confident of this very thing what is that I tell you what I'm confident in I'm sure that I married her I'm sure that I've got three kids Six grandchildren, one away. I'm sure that he called me to preach. But all that comes from, he saved me. And I've got a claim. I've got a claim. Revelation, he says, who's worthy? No, John began to weep. He said, nobody's there to claim that title deed. Then he said, one said, calm down, John. Calm down. There's one there. And the lamb says, I've got the deed to the world. <laughs> He's got mine. I know I'm his, and he is mine. I don't know how good of a Christian I am. Some days I think I'm awful. Some days I'm like, man, I can't believe you did that with me today. I just know I am, though. I'm not asking you to be all that. I'm asking you to make sure you've got a claim to what's yours. So you can get some conviction about you. Because church, you're going to need it. I want you to stand to your feet as they begin to play. I want you guys to sing, if you will. I don't want the congregation to sing if you don't mind. Here's what I'd like you to do.
I don't like you to respond to the music. I'd like you to respond to the Lord. 